Here I have the graph of a cubic. What I want to do is use the enderiv function on TI-84 to analyze its behavior. We're going to graph both of them together. I've gone to the y equals menu where you can see the equation for our cubic. And in the y2, we're going to enter the derivative of y1. Go to the math menu and find the enderiv function. It brings up a nice little template. We'll indicate that we're taking the derivative with respect to x, and we're going to take the derivative of y1. So I go to the y variables menu to retrieve the function y1. Now instead of evaluating this end derivative at a single point, we're going to evaluate it at each x value across the screen. So I have entered that, and here comes the graph of the derivative. Not surprisingly, it's a graph of a quadratic. I want to draw a special attention to the relationship between these two graphs. Here's a relative maximum on my original cubic, and notice how it corresponds to a zero on the derivatives graph. Also, we can see that the derivative has changed sign from positive to negative there. That corresponds to the original function changing from increasing to decreasing. Now over here, where we have a relative minimum on the original function, again we have a zero for the derivative, but now the derivative sign has changed from negative to positive, corresponding to the decreasing to increasing change that we see in the original function at that relative minimum. Now over here, we have an inflection point on our original function graph. That's a place where the slope is at an extreme value. So that should correspond to an extreme value on our derivative graph. And sure enough, the lowest point on the derivative graph corresponds to the location of that inflection point. Now let's go back to the y equals menu and change to another function in y1. We won't need to change anything in y2 because we've already defined it in terms of y1. So I'm just going to make y1 the familiar function sine x. We'll graph it and notice that it's automatically graphed the derivative along with it. There we see the familiar cosine function. But even if we did not know the identities of these functions, we should be able to make sense out of the relationship between these graphs. Where our original graph has a relative max or relative min, these should correspond to zeros of the derivatives graph. Similarly, if we have an extreme value for the derivative, you would expect to see an inflection point on the graph of the original function. The skill at relating the behaviors of the graph of a function and its derivative is very valuable. Now let's try one more thing here. I'm going to slightly edit my original function y1. Instead of sine of x, let's look at sine of 2x. And we'll get a chance to see a graphical interpretation of the chain rule. There's the graph of my original function, and there's the graph of its derivative. Now, sine of 2x has a period of only half of that of sine x. So instead of a regular period of 2 pi, we now have a period of pi. It makes sense that the period of the derivative would also be cut in half. But notice the amplitude of the derivative's graph is twice that of the original. That's the chain rule in effect. We've introduced an additional factor of 2 by taking the derivative and it makes sense graphically because of the behavior of sine of 2x. Now we can even go out a step further and think about what would the second derivatives graph look like. We can accomplish that by simply taking the derivative of the derivative. So in y3, I've pulled up n deriv. We're going to take the numerical derivative of the function y2 this time. So the derivative of the first derivative will give us the second derivative. Now that we have that entered, we can plot it. And as you might expect, the chain rule kicks in again, and it's doubled the amplitude yet again. A set of three graphs like these makes the basis for a great assessment item for testing graphical understanding of derivatives. So given three graphs where you're told one is the function graph, one's the first derivative, and one's the second derivative, you should be able to tell them apart by using your knowledge of derivatives.